Hello, Dominic Herbst here, the uh, author of Restoring Relationships, and I want to talk about single and not alone. Um, we, we often would uh, apply the fact that if we have no one else around to be with us in our adult years, that we would automatically be suffering with loneliness or being alone. And we want to look uh, at a biblical perspective of that. Before I commence right now, I want to remind you of our YouTube channel. It's at Restoring Relationships, and uh, you're welcome to subscribe. You'll get all the new videos that are uploaded there, and they're all free. They're free resources that might hit exactly where you have a need on that particular day. Also, Restoring Relationships, our webpage, .org. And uh, you, some of you may be on our email list and others of you may want to be. So certainly reach out to us and, and uh, we'll let you know about that. Please do not forget about our upcoming encounter outside of Fort Worth, Texas in the last weekend of June. And that's uh, June 26th, I believe. Just think of the last weekend beginning Friday and Saturday. And then I'll be at the pulpit on Sunday morning at uh, uh, Bethesda Community Church uh, there outside of Fort Worth. Look forward to seeing you there. Now, as I begin, many of you have heard of the verse in, in the Genesis where after uh, the Lord God, the Creator God, created everything, He said it was good. It was good. I'll never forget the Bible teacher that said, now go home and read this and look for the one thing that God said was not good. Well, that's what we're going to talk about. And it's, he said, with, the, with regard to uh, creating Adam, that it was not good that man should be alone. In other words, he needed to help me. He needed someone on the horizontal plane with him. And of course, this was before the fall, that the communion connection was different, certainly, than it was with God. I didn't say better. Please don't lose sight of that. We naturally believe because we're created in this fleshly body that the best thing we could ever have is someone to share our life with. No, that is an awesome, great thing. Someone we deeply love and who loves us. Well, but the best thing is the communion we have with God. And as we look at certain situations in the scriptures, you might have a different perspective on this because the enemy loves to use this, this singleness to make a person feel so alone that God has abandoned them. He will lie to them. He will say things to them that they're not worthy, that they have done things to chase that other person away, or if they could have done things better. This, see, these are the lies of the enemy, and what they will do is blind us to the communion of the Holy Spirit, who's bearing witness with our spirit as to what the real purpose is that God has in that time of being set apart. Let's look at it that way, single and set apart. So those of you who are single in the adult years, you may be struggling right now with being alone, feeling alone, hurting alone, that there's no one even there to share pain with you. You may be a single parent that went through a painful divorce, and now you're in the uh, custodial sharing time where you have as many goodbyes as you do with hellos with your children each week. As much as you're saying hello to them, you're saying goodbye because they're leaving you and they're overnight in another household. And I can't imagine this pain as a parent, but I can, I can certainly identify with it as a child. And when my parents split up, I went from Third Street to, to, to Market Street, from my dad's place to my mom's place. It was very difficult uh, for me, and I know it is for the children as well, and you see it. But those of you that invest in them while they're there with you, God can transcend the pain that they're experiencing. And that's for another time. So uh, you may be single and have been for a long time. Maybe it's not, you just haven't been married yet. And your relationships that you've had leading to a potential marriage just haven't worked out. And you begin to question yourself and you wonder why. Yet there is purpose in everything that God has for you and I, even if we don't like it. God will have an eternal purpose for it, but we have to look to him for it. The enemy will get in there and he will cut off any whispering of the spirit of the still small voice to you and I as to what that purpose might be. What the enemy will do is he'll lie to you. 
repeatedly. And he is very convincing. He massages your mind. It comes as your thoughts. So when you have the thought, it's first person. I must not be worthy. I'll never have a person that will love me. I'll never be able to have a marriage that is real and lasting. Those are lies. Cast them down. Bind them. This is why the Bible says, take every thought captive. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against God and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Take them captive. Don't just let them lay there. Don't let them echo in there. The enemy literally lifts statements that you've said before and that other people have said to you and I. And he will use those statements, cursing statements, that kind of put you in a place where you feel as if you're trapped there. It's all lies. It's a mirage. It's like being in the desert and you need water to live and you're set up to see something that really isn't there. That's what the enemy does when you and I are in pain. He sets up mirages in our mind, but they're lies. And we exchange the truth of God for a lie. So that lie becomes more truth to you than, than, uh, uh, than the lie. Uh, the lie becomes the truth and then the truth becomes the lie and you don't know what to believe anymore. So be very careful because the enemy is a tactical master, and he will do whatever he can, and he will make things sound like that uh, they're true when they're not true. He knows exactly the places of our weakness that we will grab hold of. Uh, you know, uh, one author, I think John Bevere, called it the bait of Satan. Certain kind of fish take certain kind of bait. Well, the enemy knows the bait that we're going to grab onto, so be very careful. So there are also so many variations to this whole theme, such as being divorced without children. So now you don't even have a shared custody situation, and in one sense, you're glad that the children aren't shuffled back and forth, but in the other, you're alone from a spouse, and now you're alone from uh, any type of children. And regardless, the outcome is the same. You feel alone, especially because you are single. And the natural conclusion would be, because I am single, that is why I feel alone. Another lie. No. Are you literally alone from that other person? Yes. Yes. Uh, are you able to not be alone while you're not with them? Yes. But if you aren't, it's because you've come under the darkness that has settled over you. So the, uh, those of you that uh, have been married uh, and are now divorced, I wonder if you ever felt alone while you were married. I have to deal and walk with people that are married currently that one or both, and usually both, feel alone in the marriage. They, they feel totally alone, yet they're both home every night to be with one another, but they have no ability to have a communion of intimacy of heart. Therefore, that even though they go through the business part of the marital relationship, they're alone. And it's tormenting because they each married the person they thought would make them happy. And in effect, it's, it's the opposite effect, that because there are certain situations in each of the spouses not only are they not making each other happy, they are provoking each other and they are tormenting each other. And some of these people are looking to get out to be alone. And some people actually, once they get apart, actually feel better being away from the spouse. And they say, this is the best situation I've had in years since I've been married. And they're describing the best situation as being away from that person. What I'm trying to say here is, I'm not trying to say it's better to be away from and not have a spouse. I'm not saying that it's worse to be in a marital situation and still feel alone. I'm saying that the enemy will use any context he can if he can blind you and I to come under it and not trust God for the purposes by which season we may be in right now. Let me talk more of that. Um, so, what if there is a place of communion with the Holy Spirit that you have yet to transcend, meaning to take you into a place of communion with God every time lonely feelings come over you and any lonely season that you might have experienced, that the Holy Spirit can actually take you to a place of communion on the vertical plane that you've never before had? What if you never would have known that that was there while you were with someone? Let's go deeper on this. Although not good that man should be alone, imagine a place of communion with the Spirit of the Lord where he takes us to a place of what's called unbridled glory, meaning that in the supernatural realm, there is the glory of kingdom 
experience. We can bring that to earth. Thy kingdom come in the uh, Lord's Prayer. We can draw that to earth. You can draw that into you, the kingdom experience of the presence of the Holy Spirit. But see, the enemy is so busy bombarding you with lies that you don't believe you're worthy of that. You don't believe it's possible to do that. But if you're willing to look in and listen to the still small voice of the Holy Spirit and call upon the Lord and repent from any time you have not trusted the word that he has given you, you will go to a place where Job did in chapter 42. And I've used this verse very often because it's not only intriguing to me, it is a glorious verse because Job, I think we all have to agree, had the worst experiences that anybody could ever imagine and never imagine. And he all but demanded that God speak to him. He felt that he deserved at least an explanation for what he had gone through. And in the chapters preceding 42, God proceeds to talk about the glories of all of his creation. He began to open up to Job things that Job could never have considered in his finite mind. And Job said this in chapter 42 after losing all of his family, all of his holdings, even his own wife said to him, why do you even retain your integrity? Curse God and die. And she was hurting too. But here's Job all alone, even his three friends who were there to weep with him seven days and seven nights upon seeing his, his torment, then began to open their mouths and darken the wise counsel of God. Why? They're finite. They didn't have a wisdom from above. They didn't have the ways and understanding of what God was doing for Job and what he was trying to show him. And Job said in chapter 42, that I saw things too wonderful that I knew not. He experienced a place with God that he never would have experienced had he not gone through what he went through. Now, none of us would ever volunteer that. None of you that are in your single status right now, well, maybe some of you have arrived at a place that you are settled in until God makes changes or creates in your heart uh, an ability to know him and to walk with him in ways very few people will ever know when they're in a couple situation. Yeah, that's the reality of it. So uh, it, wherever you are, if you consider Job and all that he had gone through, you can see that God had great purpose. And now through the ages of time, that scripture, it's believed to be the oldest book in the Bible, that scripture is still the grace that so many people latch on to. It's the testimony that so many people hold on to to get them through the greatest struggles of their lives. And, and and I want you to also consider David in this. Now, um, um, the you may be single, okay, and you may be alone for whatever reason. But David, he was a shepherd boy, and the prophet Samuel was coming to Jesse, the father of all these sons, and um, the I believe it was six sons, including David, and the sons were all lined up. For the prophet to come. And here's David. He's off with the sheep. And the prophet, as he walked by each of the sons, he said, there, do you have any more sons? Are there any more young men that, that uh, you've had that are not here? And, and Jesse said, well, yeah, the David, the shepherd boy, is with the sheep. Now, I want you to consider something. The insignificance of of David with the father not even bringing him. Get a hired hand and put him with the sheep, but let your other son, the only son that was not brought for what I'll call the coronation of the king. Okay, we get it, dad. David is not ever going to be considered to be king, but at least let him watch which brother will be. And of course, it was way beyond that. David was the one, as you all know, was anointed king. The insignificant shepherd boy. Have you considered David's season of loneliness? Years in the fields with the sheep. There was not even another human voice. It was just him with the sheep. And what David did while he was with the sheep, he had no one to look out on the horizontal plane. So he looked in and he looked up. You know what resulted from that? An anointing so powerful that the Psalms that encourage us today were written by David during his time of greatest loneliness. 
Let's call it what it is. He was totally alone. He didn't even have people at his work site. All he had were animals. They don't speak. And he constantly was speaking to God and he felt and sensed that God was constantly speaking to him so he would write. And what he wrote was so profound, with such specificity and detail, that the anointing upon him was unique to any other type of situation. Why? When God is preparing you and I for something great in, in the perfect plan for our life, he will often, depending on your anointing, he will allow the circumstances that may even be created by the enemy. But he will use those circumstances to take you to a place with him, if you're willing, that will prepare you for glories unknown in the days ahead as part of the ministry of what you endured while you were separated away. I heard one preacher say it this way, when God wants to make a man, he takes everything. That includes a woman. He takes everything and everyone away from them. That even the people that are closest to them cannot possibly speak in to the plight and the pain that they're experiencing while they're alone. Because their plight is unique to anyone else, even though there's a lot of people without anybody else. So the enemy is getting to you in a fast and furious pace to try to draw your mind away from what God wants to do and distract you with chatter, chatter, chatter against your mind. And he will take you into a very dark place during this time when you are single. And he will convince you, if you let him, the enemy, that you are totally alone. You have no purpose. Nobody cares. There's nobody dependent upon you. There's nobody that you're able to help or, or get to because you're in this place where you don't feel you have any value or worth. That is all from the enemy. And God is saying, I want you to come against the enemy. I want you to take him captive. And I want you to look into me. And I want you to look up. And I want you to ask me to forgive you for not trusting me because that sin has hindered my communion with you. You have listened to the lies of the enemy. And when, it, when you are called to account, and many of you listening are being called to accountability right now, and you know you have listened to that voice, you not only listen, you've begun to obey it. You've begun to believe it's you and it's not. And the Lord is saying, no, I have such a plan for you. And just like I let David be away from people for a long period of time to prepare him to be king of Israel and to be a man after my own heart, that's why I prepared him. That's what I saw in him. I saw in him what he never knew. And David got angry with me at times. And he would put his fist up and say, you anoint me king to be chased like a dog and hide out in a cave. And I still loved him because he was so real. And that's what I'm doing with you right now. If you will surrender into me, if you will let me. And then consider this, when David then is not only anointed king, but now he's exalted and he goes against the giant and all of Israel, the army was frozen to go against Goliath and David slew the giant. And David was only this big giant. That giant Goliath was nine foot three. We know how tall he was. Nine foot three. There's nobody on this earth that we know of that that's tall that's ever been that tall. Okay, so David slays the giant, and then he's exalted by Israel, and then he's elevated to king. And you want to know? You know when David started to slip, when he was around people. You know when he really started to sin. Yeah, when he was married, and he saw Bathsheba. And he took her and then he killed her husband by sending him to the front lines, Uriah the Hittite. I am not suggesting in any way that being around people is a terrible thing. But it is noteworthy to know that David's greatest contributions of God through him as a vessel for the Spirit of God were when he was with the sheep and there were no people to be found. And it was during that time that his greatest legacy was formed. But ultimately, David did the right thing. He repented in Psalm 51. And he became a great testimony of coming out of great sin where God had restored him. Yeah, there were losses as a result of that sin, but God fully restored him. So if we look at this in a total
totally different way. They all, it's been said that the things in the spirit are counterintuitive to the things in the natural realm. That it's this alone time where God is preparing you for great things. I would ask you to look at this now from a whole different perspective. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He will be with you always, even to the end of the age. And I think of this one verse in Psalm 121, verse 1. I lift up my eyes to the hills. David lifted his eyes up. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. So David's saying, stop looking down. The word of God is saying, stop looking down. The enemy is beating you over the head with these lies. Stop looking down. Look up, rise up, lift up your eyes under the hills. I say, lift up your eyes now under the heavens and let the Lord show you just a piece of his glory and then immerse yourself fully and completely. Pray, pray with me. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, for all that are struggling right now in the painful times of being totally alone, I pray that they would engage your spirit like they never have, that they look in and ask your spirit to show them what you're trying to reveal to them in your still small voice and that they would surrender to you those areas that they have held back where the enemy is tormenting them, and that they would repent for those areas that they have not obeyed you because the enemy has convinced them of the lie. And as they look up in repentance, asking forgiveness, that you would restore your fullness of your intimate communion with their heart, their life, their spirit, their soul, and that they would be so lifted above their circumstances that they would see things too wonderful that they knew not. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I'll see you next week. Thank you for being here.